King 5, it says, God says he would never leave us nor forsake us. For six hours, Jesus was suspended between heaven and earth as he suffered on the cross. And he cried out, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? This was the first time that Jesus had ever referred to the Father as God. Up until then, he was always my Father. Our Heavenly Father had to turn his back on Jesus because he could not look upon evil. And Jesus had taken on all the sins of this world. All of our sins. So what does this mean for me and you? It means that because Jesus took our place, that God would never turn his back on us because he had to turn his back on his son. Amen. This is Mother's Day. This is a great and a wonderful day. But this is a hard day for others. I want you guys to know that God loves you. And I want you to experience his love and his presence during this time because this day is so hard for others they'd rather be at home in the bed under the covers because they are missing and longing for their mothers but you have a heavenly father that will surround you with his love that will surround you with his presence. So I pray that you call up out to him and call upon him this day because he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never give up on you. He will always and have always will love and protect you. Amen. Let's speak up love before I break off. you bless all the mothers on their Mother's Day. I pray that it is a very special time for them. Father, I thank you for this service this morning, and I pray in the name of Jesus that you would have your way. So, Lord, we just give you all the honor, we give you all the glory, we give you all the praise, and we give you the thanksgiving for who you are and all that you are, and all that you are to us, because one thing I know for sure, that you will be who we need you to be, when we need you to be it. So we bless you and we thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, hallelujah. Bless the Lord, amen. For this is yet the day that the Lord has made, and in it we will rejoice, and in him we will be glad, amen. Amen, good morning to you all. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, all the aunts, all the grandmothers. Amen. We say thank God for mama. Amen. Amen. And I thank God for my mama. Amen. And I thank God for my mom being here in the place with us this, this morning. God, I give you praise. I give you thanks, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When in Matthew, the Bible talks about those that hear the word of God and obey they are likened to those that build their house on a rock. Amen. And that when the rains came and the winds blew, amen, that house was still standing. But those that did not heed and obey the voice of God, their house was likened to someone who builds their house on shifting sand. And when the rains came and the winds blew, it says that house fell and great was its fall. What is all that to say? We must build our house 
on the rock. Amen. And that rock is Jesus. Amen. And we just come to encourage you this morning. He won't fail. He won't. I said he won't fail. He won't fail. For in him is no failure. So whatever you may be facing, whatever you may be going through, however you may be feeling this morning, know that he will not fail you. As Deaconess Deirdre just said, he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He won't. He won't. Amen.
church say amen. amen. Hallelujah. We bless the Lord this morning. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, good morning to all of you this morning. And thank you for being with us. Those of you that are with us this morning here. And well, those of you that are watching us on Facebook and YouTube. To Stephanie's mother, God bless you this morning for being here with us. And to Dr. G, thank you for being with us. And Miss Tina, thank you for being with us this morning. For all the mothers, God bless you this morning. And to Mount Claire, God bless you this morning. Good to see you this morning. You got a birthday coming up. May the 30th. How about that? God bless you. Amen. If you would open your Bibles to the book of Titus and to all the mothers, happy Mother's Day. Let me just say this as we turn to Titus, second chapter. If you have a made Mother's Day plans, you won't be able to get into whatever you might think you're going to get in out of the church. The reservations have been taken up for months. So if you, you might have to do it after Mother's Day because it's book, believe me, it's book. This day is celebrated other than maybe Christmas and Easter. This is the most celebrated holiday uh, known to mankind. Mothers are special. Amen. Mothers are special. In Titus, the second chapter, we're going to read verses 1 through 4. And it reads as follows. As for you, Titus promotes the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. I'm reading the New Living King, New Living Translation. Teach the older men to exercise control, to be worthy of respect, and to live wisely. They must have sound faith and be filled with love and patience. Verse 3. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children to love their husbands and their children. My text this morning is Motherhood the Christian Way. Motherhood the Christian Way. Father, we thank you for this celebrated holiday, the day that we celebrate mothers, but more than celebrating mothers, we celebrate you, the one who has given mothers the right to become who they are, the one you created, oh God, the ones you created, the special ones, the unique ones that you have created. So we celebrate them on this day, O oh God, but we honor and reverence you, the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that dwells therein. Father, hide me behind the cross. It's not about me, but it's all about you. Let no flesh glory in your presence. It's just the spirit that quickened the flesh part of nothing and the words that I speak. They are spirit and they are life. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Also, as you may be seated, glad to see Sakisha and her family, her sister, here, and niece and nephew here with us today. As you know, uh, her father was funeralized on this past uh, Friday, so we have to see them with us this morning. Let me just start out by talking about the anatomy of a, a woman. I won't go too deep because I can't go too deep. I just said a little bit about a woman. A woman is the only one who can conceive. She's the only one that can conceive. She's the only one that can carry a baby and give birth. Only a woman can do that. The female is the only one with reproductive organs. She has ovaries, which are a key part of the reproductive function of women. She also has what's known as the Philippian tubes, which carry the egg cells from the ovaries. Fertilization of an egg cell by sperm typically occurs inside the Philippian tubes. She has a uterus and she has a vagina. These are all part of the reproductive system. So she's the only one created and designed to conceive, carry a baby for nine months, and to give birth. A man cannot give birth because he does not have the reproductive organs. Somebody say amen. amen. I know there's a lot of stuff going on in society today. We know that a lot of people are struggling with sexual identity uh, and that kind of thing. But let me just say this, regardless of what society uh, accepts and what they support, it would never change the fact that only a woman can have a baby. I don't know this for sure, but I would imagine because there's always some type of test going on. There's always some type of 
things that are being done in science to try to change things. But I just believe that God made this so that no man, regardless of how smart or warm how smart she may be, they'll never be able to change what God designed and what God intended. Amen. So being a mother is a, a very important role, uh, one that the Lord chooses to give to women. Uh, and unfortunately, some women can't, can't have uh, children, either because of something related to them spiritually or something that's related to them biologically. Hannah was a person who the Bible says that God said that her, he had closed up her womb, which possibly means that there was something going on spiritually with Hannah. So if God, if something, if God closed up her womb, God would be the only one that could open her womb, and that's what he did. So let me just say this, that some women, even though they can't have children, they can have bonus children, they can adopt children, and regardless, it still makes them mothers because they still have to care for the church and still have that responsibility. Now, Paul writes this letter to Titus. Titus was a Greek believer. He was overseer of the church in, in Crete. And Paul had left him in charge because typically what happens is when an apostle goes out and establishes a church, he leaves somebody there in charge to carry on the teachings that had been taking place, that he had, that had been teaching. So what he did was he selected Titus and he sent this letter to Titus because he wanted Titus to continue in the vein that he had started about teaching. And so he says to Titus, he says, because uh, he wanted to make sure there was no, no vacuum there, he, he give, uh, Titus, uh, charges him with these instructions. He says, look, he said, I want you to teach older women. But before he says that, he starts talking about men. I don't talk too much about men. I want to talk about women. He talks about men. He says that men should live a lifestyle that's worthy of respect. I want to tell you something that, 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 that you won't respect a man unless you see that he's living a lifestyle worthy of respect. You, you don't respect me just because I'm a man. You respect me because of the lifestyle that I live. That's what it should be. Not just because I'm a man, not just because I'm a politician, not just because I'm a pastor, but it should be worthy of the lifestyle that I live. If I'm not living the lifestyle that I should live based on God's word, then you shouldn't honor me. You shouldn't respect me as a man. So he goes on to say to, Tim, to Titus, similarly, he says, I want you to teach the women, the older women. He says the older women, because it starts with the older women. There's something that they should be doing. He says, teach them uh, to live in a way that honors God. Teach them in a way that, that honors God. Teach them uh, uh, to live in a way that honors God so that, that when people see them, they see God in them. He wants to do something older women because what is done in older women will be passed on to younger women. See, it should be that in our houses, in our homes today, that the older women, grandmother, mother, aunts, older, they should be teaching the young women. Say amen. amen. <laughs> that's what it, back in the day, that's what it used to be. He says, teach them a way that they respect and and reverence God because that brings God glory. It brings him glory. He says uh, a life full of respect and love for others. They should be teaching older women. Titus teach older women that they need to love others. And that teaches the younger women that they should love others. And as a result of that, we got more people loving each other. So we got a problem because we don't see much of that these days. Older women are trying to be young women. That's a fact. There's no cutoff anymore. I went to the, to the mall yesterday, and when I went to the mall yesterday, I was getting my favorite bourbon chicken meal, and I was there, and uh, I saw something out of the corner of my eye that got my attention. What got my attention was this older woman who came in with a pair of hot pants on. I'm not exaggerating. She had on some hot pants. And she had on a top that came to about right here. And all of this was exposed. So it wasn't like she had no bang, no, 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 no body that you would say, wow, she was good for an older woman. No, she should have been covered. And not only was I looking, but everybody standing around me, they were looking. So she walked towards me because she was really somebody close to my age or old. I think she was older than I was. 
She had on face beautifully made up. She did. She had on. I, listen, I can tell you every detail. I, I saw the lip gloss. It was pink lip gloss. She had on eyeshadow. She had on the lines that came out the eyes and kind of came out like this. You know, she had. She had. I saw the detail. Her hair pulled back and her ponytail. But but the way she was dressed. She, the way she was dressed wasn't modest. It wasn't appropriate for somebody her age. It just wasn't. And so, and she was with, I assume, her daughter, who like she may have been in her 40s. Well, older women should teach younger women how they should dress. That's what they should be teaching. We don't see much of that anymore these days. We see older women trying to be like the young women. I don't go to the club anymore, but when I went to the club, there were three generations in there. There was the grandma, <laughs> It may have been the great-grandma, the mama, and then the, the child. I'm just saying, they, they, they want to, every, it, it, they just, it's just not the way it used to be. Our society has deteriorated. So Paul is telling Titus, I want you to teach this. We don't teach this in church anymore because what we're trying to teach now are messages that make people feel good as opposed to teaching them what God expects from us. And when somebody's teaching what God expects, they don't want to hear that person because they said that's old-fashioned. No, it's not old-fashioned. It's God. He wants us to live a certain way. He's demanding that we live a certain way. And there's no, no, he, there's no compromising with God. This is the way it is. So he tells the old women that they should be teaching the young women to love their children, to love them, to love their children. Why would he have to say, love your children? Why would he have to tell, Titus to tell them to teach that? You would think that's a natural thing, that you love your children. He has to teach them to love their children. That means, that word love is philotic, no, let me, let me, let me spell it. P-H-I-L-O-T-E-K-N-O-S. Philoticonus. That's the best I'm going to give you. That's the best I'm going to give you. Here's what it means. It means to be fond of. It means to be motherly. It means to be maternal. Every mother is not maternal. Every mother doesn't know how to be a mother. Every mother isn't born with maternal instincts. So he's saying all the women teach them how to be maternal, to have the characteristics of being a mother, to look after or care for their children, taking on the responsibility of a mother, uh, such as raising their children. Responsibility of raising their children. Some children are neglected because mothers will not take the time to raise them. Children should not be raising themselves. They shouldn't be raising themselves. Uh, because if, they, if they're raising themselves, they're going to be looking for love outside the home. And if they don't get it at home, they'll find it in the streets with a man or a woman. Because there are prowlers out there. There are people who are the predators, the waiting. The Bible says that the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So some mothers struggle to love their children or care for them because they don't want responsibility. It restricts them. It, it, it keeps them from being able to dress they want, the way they want to dress, to buy things that they, they want to buy. Uh, and if they're single, it might cost them a relationship because they might meet a man and he says, I don't, want, I don't want to raise somebody else's children. Too much drama in raising somebody else's children. So they say, you know what? I, I, I don't want to deal with my children. I'm going to disown them because I'm looking for somebody. Mm. I heard on the radio the other day, you may have heard this as well. I said the other day, man, it was about two or three weeks ago. There was this mother who decided, this mother decided she'd go on a cruise. And she left her seven and eight-year-old children at home by themselves. She went on a five-day cruise. And they had this on the radio now. I don't know how they I don't know how people find out about the stuff they find out about. And so they had people calling in and saying, What do you think about this? I was surprised at some of the responses. Some of the people said she may have needed a break. It's so it was okay for them. Her to leave them at home. Some said, no, she shouldn't have done it. If she was having some mental struggles, she should have got somebody to come and help her or send them, home, send them to some relative's house 
but she shouldn't have left them at home. She went on a four, four or five day cruise. I guess she had rings set up in her house where she could see what they were doing. She called them every day. But those kids were seven, eight years old, taking care of themselves, going to school and doing everything for themselves. And a neighbor just happened to see that they were by themselves, didn't see the mother, and he called the police. And the police came. Well, the police came and took them into custody. The mother, when she came back, they arrested her for that man. So the good thing about it is some of the relatives stepped in and kept them from going into foster care. But she did not want responsibility. You can't neglect your children now in a period of time in your life. A mother can't, can't do that. God expects more. Amen? So caring for a child is way more than just making sure they're fed every day and just got on clean clothes. It's more than just taking them to the doctor visit once or twice a year or, or taking them to have the teeth clean you know, twice a year. It, it, it's more than that. It's part of that, but it's way more than that. And that's the part that some mothers find undesirable. So mothers should, listen to this, nurture, affectionately embrace, give instruction and direction to the children. They should be seen, children should be seen as a gift from God. Not, not, not a problem, not, a, not, a, not burdensome, but a gift from God. It's a gift from God. So when you have that perspective, that they're a gift from God, it changes the way you care for your children. Let's talk about some of the things that God expects of uh, mothers uh, Christian mothers to uh, to behave and care for their children. One way is nurturing. They should nurture their, their children. Nurturing is the act or process of raising and promoting the development of, is training, educating, fostering from conception onward. So in other words, it never stops. I don't care if your mother is 90 years old and you 75. She's still Nurses that child. All, it's all, she's always going to see, a, a nurturing mother will always see a child as a child, regardless of their, their age. So nurturing involves interaction, and, and there is a high level of care and open affection for the child. I, I saw this recently, you know, I look at YouTube a lot, and so I, I went to YouTube and I saw this, these two dogs, and this mother dog was just loving on this puppy. She licked that puppy for five minutes straight. I'm telling you. <laughs> for five minutes straight, she, she licked on that dog. Then she, when the, dog, the puppy got ready to go somewhere and should have gone, she nudged the puppy back. She cared for that puppy the whole time. And you could tell she was nurturing, made sure that the puppy was being fed because at the appropriate time, she laid it on one side and the puppy knew to come and nurse. She cared for that, that puppy and she, she helped him and, and, uh, to move and to watch over him. So she was, she was raising the puppy, amen? Then they cuddled openly, and she was showing her love for that, that puppy. Now, if a dog did that, what should mothers do? So nursing also involves encouraging and, and mentoring, demonstrating how to conduct yourself, uh, uh, how a child should conduct themselves, how they should eat, and uh, how they sit, uh, whether it's at home or in public. And not enough of that's going on at home. Mother's not doing enough of that. That's why children get out and they just, they just go crazy. Uh, I, I saw on, on, on a, a must have been Judge Matthews or something some years ago that uh, this lady sued this man because uh, they were at an island. And the little boy was just beating on the seat. Just beating on the seat, just beating on the seat, just beating on the seat and jumping up and down, beating on the seat. And when the man finally turned around and said, Stop! The boy fell. Injured himself. So she lady sued him, mother sued him. <laughs> she took him to court, she sued him. And so he got all and went through all the you know, all the facts and everything else. And the, the verdict was in favor of the defense. Because he said, when the little boy was jumping up and down and, and being a seat, did you say anything? And she said, No, I didn't. He said, he's a child. And she said, he said, Well, you should control your child. Verdict for the for the defendant. At home, you got to teach them at home how they're supposed to behave. That's part of raising the child. Amen? And so it's affectionately embracing and hugging the child. Or, or touching them is, is very important. And a Christian mother will consistently reinforce the child's value and ensure that there's no lack of self-worth. So nurture is not just at birth, but it continues onward. And a child needs to feel whole and 
And uh, the Christian mother plays a huge role in making sure that the child, that this happens through nurturing. Amen? So one of the things I was happy to see uh, recently was my daughter uh, enrolled my granddaughter in what you all know as debutantes. And I was so pleased because me as a father, I've been saying to my daughter, I said, get her in something outside of just dance and school and get her into something else that will help make her, her uh, uh, have a, a wider uh, perspective about things, a wider view about things. So she went into uh, this debutante program that, that lasted, I don't know, what, 8, 12 weeks or something like that. Then they had this great debutante ball and, and uh, it was fabulous and, and it was just something to make you proud. But, but uh, at the end, they had a chance to stand before the council people in New County. I watched this on video, and the, uh, the person that wrote the program, the director of the program, says, does anybody want to stand up and say something about what they learned from this program? My granddaughter was the first one that jumped up. She got up and she stood and she said, let me tell you how I didn't know this was going to give me this kind of information. I didn't know that this was going to do this for me and that for me and this for me. She said, now I got a sisterhood. All the ones that were my fellow debutantes, I got a sis sisterhood now. And listen, they were poor lawyers. They were poor judges. They had exposure to all these people. See, nursing is a part of developing and training and giving kids exposure to things. Amen? So it, it, makes, it makes a mother proud when they see what they put into them starts to pay off. So it creates a lot of confidence in, in uh, who they are. So other things that we see, look at the book of Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, that God commands a Christian woman Christian mothers, one's nurturing. Look at Deuteronomy 6 chapter. Look at verses 6 through 7. It says this, And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road when you're going to bed and when you get up. Availability. Christian mothers are available to their children. He says, you have to have availability for your children. When you're at home, you can't say, I'm watching my favorite TV program. I'm on the telephone. Don't you see I'm on the telephone? No, you have to be available. Amen? So whether it's early in the morning, was late at night, it, it doesn't matter. See, your, your availability will influence how they think and, and feel about themselves. Am I important to you? Do I matter? Too many children are committing suicide. Too many children are committing suicide or participating in deviant behavior because of lack of availability of mothers. And they will look for attention from someone or something else. It happens all the time. There was a time when mothers wanted to be stay-at-home mothers to enjoy their children and, and, and raise them. And now, I know you should probably say, well, you're 70 years old. Don't nobody do that anymore. I understand the cost of inflation. I understand that, that mothers have to work. And by no means am I saying that women should have careers. I don't believe that. I believe women should have careers. I firmly believe that. I think they should, women should do, if they, that's what they desire to do, then that's what they should do. But they have to understand, too, if they have a career, they have to be available for their children. And so you have to make sure you call about time for your children. Amen? You can't come home and say, I'm too tired to talk to you right now. I, I don't have the energy. Work drained me. No, that's not the child's fault. Amen? So here's what it's called. It's called sacrificing. It's sacrificing your time to be with them and to be available. And everybody's busy, but you should never be too busy to spend time with your children. You need to support whatever it is they're doing. Go into their room, sit down and talk to them, ask questions, uh, make sure you understand what they're being challenged with. It's availability. Mothers should be available to their children. Can I get y'all to say amen? amen. Yeah, yeah, I, this is not foreign language to you, is it? Yeah. <laughs> Look at Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Ephesians 6. Look at verses, look at verse 4. It says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by 
the way you treat them. Rather bring them up in a discipline and, and instruction that comes from the Lord. This also applies to mothers. So what is he saying? He says, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He's saying with loving kindness. He says with discipline. But the discipline there, the word there is instruction of the Lord. Bring them up in the instruction of the Lord. So mothers should be sharing the word of God with their children. They shouldn't have to come to church and hear it for the first time. They should hear it at home. Amen? And so they, they should not be a lost generation. And the reason why we have lost generations is because the word of God isn't being shared with the children. And so they are a lost generation, but, but we're at fault for that. We should be sharing what we believe. Most should be sharing what, what they believe. Timothy, who was a disciple of Christ and a mentor of Paul, was brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Uh, the Bible tells us in, in 2 Timothy, the first chapter and, and the uh, fifth verse, a seventh verse, somewhere therein, uh, it says that he had a grandmother and a mother who uh, uh, shared the word of God with him. So he says, Timothy, I know about your faith. It's not an unfeigned faith because your mother and your grandmother taught you. See, see, we should be teaching the word of God. Mother should be teaching the word of God to their children. And you don't have to sit there and go from Genesis to Revelation. You can just find some things to teach on. You can find some things to teach on about honesty. You can find some things to teach on about integrity. You can find some things to think about, talk about when it comes to who God is. But the word of God should be shared with them because the world is going to share its view. Why not want mother sharing the view about God, giving them a biblical viewpoint about things? And they trust mom. You know why? Because your mom. Your mom. That child has had nine months before anybody else to have influence on that child. When that baby's in the womb, the mother has established a relationship with them right then, an intimate relationship with them right then. Whether you're reading or just talking to them, whatever you're doing, you're establishing a relationship with that child and an intimate relationship with them. They trust mom. Another thing that God commands of, of mothers, Christian mothers, is discipline. Not discipline the mothers, but discipline the children. I think we got reversed sometimes. The children won't discipline the parents. <laughs> Why don't you tell them how wrong they are? <laughs> but correction would be should be with love. Listen, discipline doesn't always have to be harsh and condescending. We think when we discipline somebody, you got to get all in their face and just tell them all about themselves and speak down to them and make them just feel some kind of way. But no, that's not, that's, not, that's, not, that's not the way God expects a Christian mother to discipline a child. Proverbs 13, 24 says this, spare the rod and spoil the child. We don't want to hear that anymore. Spare the rod? What do you mean spare the rod? You can't beat these children today. The devil's a liar. You can. <laughs> Just take the word beat out. But you can certainly discipline them. That's the problem. So some children are allowed to do things without any fear of discipline at all. So uh, I know things are different now. I know you can't you can't beat your children the way I got beat. I mean, I, I, when I say I got beat, my sister can tell you, I got beat. And I don't, I don't mean quilt, I got beat. Uh, my dad was going to get the longest switch. Uh, not, it wasn't a switch, it was a limb. And he was left-handed. That thing was like a quilt. And uh, sometimes he'd have a claw head between his legs. He grabbed my pants and he wear, wear, wear us out. He wear, I mean, he wear us out. And uh, some of the dance that the kids are doing now, I was doing no dancing back then because my dad had me moving all over the place, <laughs> trying to get out of the way of that switch. And it's interesting because he didn't beat the, he didn't beat my sister like that because my mom wouldn't let him. She he say she say to him. You can't scar my daughter's legs. You can't do that. So he she won't let him whip him like that. But the boys, we got beat. And I got the worst beating of them all. And you would have thought it would have made me better. It finally did. <laughs> listen, listen to this. I'm not ashamed to say this. I got my last whip when I was 18 years old. I was 18, I was a senior in high school. My dad told me, he said, be home at a certain time. Be home at 12. My girlfriend could stay up at 1 o'clock. I had to be home at 12. I couldn't be no, that couldn't be the kind of guy that my girlfriend could stay out longer than I could. So when he said be home, I knew, I mean, it wasn't my mind, it was my mind. But, but, 
She done to be home to one, so guess what? I made her my own curfew. I got home at one o'clock, and I got home, he said, no, wait on me. He said, didn't I tell you to be home at 12? I won't say, Dad, Dad, uh, Dad, understand. I got a girlfriend, she's down for one. Dad, can you help me out here? <laughs> no, I, I, I ain't know how to say that to her. And uh, I got my last book at 18. Discipline is not a bad thing. It taught me something. It taught me that I have to obey authority. Amen? So there's a certain way that uh, we should discipline our children because they should be taught about boundaries at a young age. And so why are all these children fighting in school and after school? Why do we see all this fighting on the bus? All this kind of stuff. Why, why would we say it? Because there's not uh, enough discipline taking place at home. Uh, I know you can't knock them in the face like we used to. I know you can't. I, there were times when my, my wife uh, and my daughter can tell you, my older daughter can tell you this. My daughter said something disrespectful to my wife. She pulled over on I 20 on the side of the road. On I 20 with a car flying up and down the street. <laughs> pulled over on the side of the road. And she beat her right there on the side of the road. I mean, she, she didn't get out of the car and come back and beat her. She, re she, reached, back and, she reached back and beat her. <laughs> so it starts at an early, early age. Amen? Proverbs 19, 18 says this. It says that discipline your children while they're still whole. While they're still whole. Or otherwise, you will ruin their lives. If you don't discipline while there's hope, while they're young, you will ruin their life because they end up getting all kinds of stuff because there's no fear about rep repercussions about anything they do. So mothers have to make sure that they discipline their, their children. And if you wait until the, in the teenage years, you wait too long. It, it, it's too late. They've gone too far. I can't understand this. You may be able to understand, but I can't understand it. When I hear about the robbers taking place, the burglaries are taking place, how is it that a 13-year-old involved in that? Seventh, eighth grade, how is it that person can be out the house at two o'clock in the morning? How is that person out at one o'clock, three o'clock in the morning? A 13 year old child, how is that? I don't, I don't, I don't understand it. It says that there's not enough discipline taking place. You've gotten to the point where the children are telling you what they're going to do. And that's something, something's wrong with, with that. So if you don't discipline at home, they won't learn to obey authority uh, outside the home. Proverbs 22, 15 says this. You see the foolishness in the youngster's heart, but physical discipline will drive it away. <laughs> you see the foolishness. You say they're doing stuff they shouldn't do, but you won't discipline them to drive it away. You listen, I, I know I, I know I know time out is good. I know it is. But then I know time on is good too. That's when you need to be time on. <laughs> Amen. You got to be. You, you, you have to. You have to be. I. I. Again, when I talk about this one, I'm not talking about killing your child. I was. Uh, uh, it's, it's probably 25 years ago. I was outside cutting my grass, and I saw this young boy go over to my neighbor's house, and I saw them standing there talking for a long time. He finally beckoned for me to come over. Why you got me involved, I don't know. He's standing there talking to this young man. He says to me, he says, Gary, this young man refuses to go home. And I said, really? He said, why? I said, why? He said, well, he said that when he taking the groceries out of the car, he made a mistake and hit his mother's car. She, this one, Lexus, that first come out in 1990, 1991. She had a brand new white Lexus. And he scratched the car. And she went crazy. She told him, get in there, strip down to his underwear, and she went and got high in the court. He ran. He left the house. He ran away. He ended up in our community. So he's telling me the story. Last time, uh, I, I said to him, I said, call your mother. He called his mother. She lived in the neighborhood behind. She came over. And she said, start trying to pull her. Said, let's go. Let's go. He said, uh-uh. I'm not going. I'm not going because you're going to beat me. I'm not going because you're going to beat me. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going home. He grabbed hold to the iron rail. That man's uh, porch. He refused. She couldn't pull him. She said, what is wrong with you? I could tell she wanted to beat him right then. But he said, no, I'm not going home. So he said, again, I'm not going to let you beat me with this iron cord. I know there was a time when we got beat with iron. People, children got beat with iron. I never experienced that. That's, that's cruel. But, but they did it. 
I'm not saying most shouldn't beat their children with iron cords. It, that's, 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 it's, it's inhumane. I said this this morning. I said, if you beat this child with iron cord, he goes to school with marks on his body, and he says, my mom beat me. I'm telling him right now, he comes to me. Here's my name, here's my number. And I said, mother, I'm gonna testify against you. That's the only way she got that boy to go home. Now, when she got home, I don't believe she beat him with the iron cord, but I still believe she beat him. <laughs> I think he's supposed to beat him. But you can't do that. That's not, that's not, that's not the kind of discipline God is talking about. You know, you, you, can't, you can't do that. So, uh, uh, one thing my wife insisted on uh, when it came to our children, and they can tell you this, is that they would never disrespect her, and they could never talk back to her. No. She said this, I am your mother. She said it like that. I am your mother. Four words. <laughs> they were powerful words. And she said it all the time. I mean, up, up until the time... You know, she until her she left this earth. She said to our children, "I don't care how old you get, you'll never be able to talk to me like you're talking to somebody else." That's discipline. You can't do that. And I hear her sometimes be sitting next to her. I hear her say, uh, "If you're gonna raise your voice at me, I'm gonna hang up this phone. If you can't talk to me like I'm your mother, I'm telling you right now, I'm hanging up." Now I hear click. <laughs> <laughs> Hang up. She wasn't going for it. It's how you discipline your children. See, it's, it's from conception onward. And so I, 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 I she, she, she just, she, she never, she just never allowed it. And when you discipline your children, when you start at an early age, it'll carry on to adulthood because they know that certain things they can't do, they can't get away with. Whether it's the mom or anybody else, that's an authority. Amen. So uh, she would tell my granddaughter. Because at that time, she was oldest. She's always been old. We'll always be oldest. But she'd come in the house, and, and Layla would take her book bag and throw it against the wall. And she said to Layla, she said, Layla, she said, you can't throw the book bag against the wall. She said, I need you to gently put it there and take your shoes off. Told Chase the same thing. You can't do that. You can't listen, listen. And she said it, she said it with, with love and kindness. But there was a firmness to it, too. Don't be beating up my wall. <laughs> don't be on my wall. And then she say, baby, what can I get you? Now, she was harder on the children than she was on the grandchildren. With the grandchildren, she was firm with them, but she showed a whole lot of love and kindness to them. She had, she had chilled out. She had rubbed out a, a, a little bit. Amen? So you, 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 you have to discipline your children, but make sure your discipline is balanced. Amen? It can't just be discipline. You have to show love as well. Go to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And look at verses 29 through 32. And it says this. It says, uh, don't use foul language or abusive abusive." Of don't use foul or abusive language. But everything you say, be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear. Skip over verse 30. Go 31. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender hearts, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven us. Mothers should encourage their children. It should be an environment where children uh, are encouraged. You cannot cuss out the children. I see mothers cussing out their children, and I see the children cussing them back out. I'm thinking to myself, they won't be in my house. <laughs> you cuss me, or cuss your mother, you got to get out of my house. You can't, you can't do that. But mothers can't use abusive, condescending language towards them either. Everything you say should be to encourage and motivate them. You should create an environment of verbal support, freedom to fail, and, and acceptance, uh, affection, and unconditional love. When they don't succeed, you say, it's okay. You do better the next time. So you can't encourage when you're angry. So the best thing to do is wait until you calm down, wait until rage has abated, and then say something encouraging because you can say something that you'll later regret. Amen? 
I was at a gas station. I've told this story before. I was at a gas station. And I was standing there pumping my gas. I heard these cuss words going. You stupid MF. What's the F wrong with you? You knucklehead. And it got my attention. I looked over there. And I see this woman cussing her son out. Why don't you hear she cussed that little boy out? She cussed that little boy out like you wouldn't believe. He was about seven, eight years old. And she was, he was sitting there just kind of like staring off with fear in his, in his eyes. I watched him in horror. And then she looked at me and she said, what the hell are you looking at? I'll come give you something too. She, she, she said, she said, I, this is my child. I just kind of shook my head. I just kind of, kind of I looked at her. I wanted to deal with that little boy's life. That was seven, eight, he's seven, eight years, and this probably been 12, 13 years ago. I wonder what that little boy's like today. I wonder, uh, did he ever recover? Because if she did that out there, can you imagine what's taking place in the home? But whatever they do wrong, see there's an opportunity to teach them to do better the next time. Encourage them, but don't abuse them with, with harsh uh, words. Amen? As we come to a close, look at Deuteronomy in the fourth chapter. Verse 9. It says, But watch out. Be careful and never forget what you have seen, what you yourself have seen. Do not let these memories escape from your mind as long as you live, and be sure to pass them on to your children and to your Grandchildren. Mothers have to model integrity and character. What you've seen, you model that. And when your children see that, they'll want to be the same way. Teach them whatever you learn. Let them be able to say good things about you because of what they saw behind closed doors, not by just what you did out in church or out in public. But behind closed doors, they saw something in you. They say you always acted uh, with good character and with, in, with in integrity. I was pumping gas at this gas station and, and this young lady walked over. You know, most kids now, young kids, they don't speak to people. If you speak to them, I just got, saw a guy driving, a, a young guy driving a, an Audi, and I said to him, oh, the car, that car is beautiful. Okay, thank you. Better say that thing back. Well, this particular day, this young lady, I didn't have to say anything to her. She's in her early 20s. She looked at me and she said, hello, sir, how are you? I said, wow. I said, that's a change. She said, what do you mean? I said, you're speaking to me. I said, most young people don't do that. She said, I was raised by my grandmother. She said, and what I saw my grandmother do, she said, that's what I did. She said, she was good for me. See, what they see, they need to see good behavior in you so they can model that same good behavior. You can look at children and tell where they've been nurtured. You can look at children and tell where they've been cared for. You can look at children and tell where they've been encouraged. You can look at them and tell where they have somebody, have had somebody in their life that they can model out. Most of the time you can tell just by interacting with them. You'll see it. They've had somebody in front of them. Somebody who has invested in them. I can look at this church. I know, I can tell from the children, by the children, whether their mother spend time with them. I don't care if they sing in a praise team. I don't care whether they usher. I don't care whatever they may be doing or they sing in the audience. I can tell whether this child has had some influence by that mother. And I can honestly say, I believe that every mother in this church, every mother in this church, has done a wonderful job. Everybody, give yourself a hand. You've done a wonderful job. So Christian mothers must take their responsibility seriously. They have a unique and crucial role in encouraging, developing, training, and the education of their children. And mother should put, she never be looked at as a bird or something unpleasant. Her role continues after birth and, and onward. Let your children be your legacy. After you're gone, let your voice speak through them. Let your life speak through them. Let their actions 
be a reflection of what you have imparted into them. Let them be your legacy. You got to invest, not just with your money, but with you. If you see them slipping in the wrong direction, get them help. Therapy. Say therapy. therapy. Therapy is not a bad word. <laughs> we think people have to be crazy to get therapy. No, sometimes, sometimes you need somebody that can talk you through some things. Sometimes kids need somebody that can talk them through some things. Because mothers don't understand, fathers don't understand. They need somebody with the skills who've been trained to help them get to the other side. So if you see them slipping, find the help that they need so they can get back on the right track. Love them through the good and the bad. The good and the bad. They're not all going to be perfect. You weren't perfect. I wasn't perfect. I'm not perfect. But my mom loved me through my good and my bad. A mother will see sometimes a child that no one else sees. A mother will see that. Hmm. A mother has a love that's so deep, so deep, there's nothing you can do to uproot that love for your children. Nothing. Because they're mom. Because they're mom. Every mom should be treated special. And even if your mom was the best mom, she's still mom. You got to love her regardless. You got to love her. Because when it's always over, you can't go back and say, I wish I had done this, I wish I had done that. No, it's over. You never get a second chance. Love her while she's alive. Love her until how important she is. And don't wait till you become an adult. Start now. Tell your mother you love her. I got my mother flowers when I was six years old. I went to the hillside picked up some flowers, just picked them off the side of the hill. I'll never forget some little yellow flowers. Mama started to grow in our yard today. And I went and got a pack of peanut butter crackers. I had a paper route, went and bought a pack of peanut butter crackers and gave it to my mother for her birthday. That was the start of something. From that day to the day I died, I sold it to my mother's life. Birthday, Christmas, anniversary, until the day she died, to the day she took her last breath, I sold it to her life. I made sure she was taken care of because she was mom. There's nobody like mom. Nobody. She's been there 15 years. But I'll never forget Annie Queen Hicks Turner. I'll never forget her because she was mom. She could do something for me that nobody else could do. She could soothe me. It was something about mom. When I had a problem, I could go to mom and just say, Mom, let me tell you how I'm feeling. And mom would listen. And because she was a Christian mom, she knew the right things to say, the right scriptures to give to me. Because she was a mom. She doesn't, didn't know what I'm teaching you today. But it was in her heart to do it. Anyway, I just made her out. <laughs> she did, but she did it in a way. Because she was a mom. Pray for your children that they remain holy. Pray for their protection of safety. And pray this, that God will always have his hands on them and they will allow God to have his hands on them. Always. In regards to what they do, make sure you show them that you love them and that you always care for them. That's motherhood, the Christian way. Can we give him a shout of praise?
sometimes no matter how old we are, we just need to be wrapped. We just need to be loved. We just need to be held. And that's what we saying this morning through this song. Asking the Father to just wrap us in his arms. Wrap us in your arms. Yeah. 
thank you, Lord God, that our hearts have been open to receive your word. And we're hiding in our hearts so that we don't sin against you, but mothers not sin against you for the word that has been given to them today, oh God. We thank you, Father, for mothers, and we thank you, Father, for who you created them to be. That they will seek you diligently. They will seek your word, oh God. And and they will take that word, Father, and not just hear it, but be doers of your word in terms of raising their children, O oh God. So we bless you, we thank you, and we praise you for your goodness and for your mercy. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. At this time, those receive our tithes and offerings. Mother's Day. 
and thank you again for visiting with us, and thank you for being here as well. Dr. G, come. said strong women raise strong children and I'm so thankful for the word that you delivered today we're so thankful that you remind us of the gift that God has given us as women the responsibility God has given us as women right before we left this morning um, I only saw like a little bit of the news I mean just and when I heard that there was a shooting in a nightclub and I don't know if you heard it Six young people were killed. Six mamas, daddies, families on Mother's Day. One of the things that we need to understand is how to cover our children with the blood of Jesus. Amen. How to encamp them. The greatest gift we can ever give, the legacy which you talked about, is not giving them iPhones and Jordans but the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Being able to pass on our faith. So that when we're gone, they know how to get a prayer past the ceiling. When we're gone, they know how to connect with God. And I'm so thankful, so thankful. Last year when we came here for Mother's Day, um, Aunt Claire and my mother were around the same age, 89, 89. Had no idea that six months later she would have a stroke. And this is the second time she's been in church since she's had the stroke. And God has been so faithful. And even as we were, as you were singing praise and worship, what is the example my mom has left me? That she could, she can't lift up her left arm, but she can lift up her right one. And that she can praise God in the midst of everything. And so this morning, as we leave this place, as Pastor has already said, Mother's Day becomes a challenge for so many who have lost, even mothers who have lost their children. But we thank God for the memories. We thank God for the mothers. We thank God for the women that God has placed in our lives, the mothers, the big mama, the, uh, the aunties, the mentors, the coaches. And I would challenge you today to not let grief, sorrow, and despair overwhelm you, to remember all of the memories that God has given you. God has been so faithful to all of us. Amen. So Father, even now, we thank you for this place called Good Works. We thank you for the word that was delivered. We thank you for the man of God who made a deposit in each one of us. Good and fertile soil. We're not just hearers, but we're doers of your word. We thank you for the word that has been hidden in our heart that we won't sin against you. Now God, help us to walk out this thing as mothers. Help us to be strong and help us, God, to be passionate and help us, God, to be examples of what it means to love you and to love each other and to love our children, our grandchildren, to be legacy carriers and legacy keepers. We're asking in the name of Jesus that your hand would rest rule and abide, that you would uphold us at the right hand of your righteousness, that goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. We serve the great I am. Nothing is too hard for you. Speak strength now, God. Sustain us around and save us. Deliver us from all evil. Let no weapon formed against us prosper. Father God, today we dwell in the secret place of the Most High under the shadows of the Almighty. And Father, today we give you glory. We give you praise. We honor you for your faithfulness, for keeping us from one year to the next. You're a keeper. You're a sustainer. You're the lifter of our head and the rock of our salvation, our promise keeper, our way maker. And today, God, we honor you. We glorify you. We magnify you. And with our hands lifted up and our mouths filled with praise, we will bless you with everything on the inside of you. And we will give you glory. We honor you this day in Jesus' name. To every mother, grandmother, big mama, auntie, nanny, co-worker, teacher, bless you in Jesus' name. 
Go in peace, and may the peace of God go with you. Amen.